Welcome everybody to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. We're so excited you're here. I'm really excited you're here to be with um, Emily Taylor. She's going to talk to us about something that can be very controversial um, and why it is, I don't know. And so this is what she's going to help us with. And that is strategic planning pitfalls. And let's give you a little hint. It's like, maybe you shouldn't just jump in, right? So we need to kind of talk about what this looks like. And Emily, the principal of Teeny Big, is going to help us um, today. And we are so excited that, Emily, you could join us. We know that from our conversation, you came to, you're came you coming to us from Chicago. Again, I'm Julia Patrick. I'm coming to you from the Southwest. Jarrett Ransom, believe it or not, the nonprofit nerd herself, she's conducting a strategic planning seminar today for a client. So, I mean, this is just such an interesting confluence of what goes on. Things like that happen all the time at the nonprofit show. And we are so blessed to have these amazing sponsoring partners with us. Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy at National University, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. If you've missed any of the 950 plus episodes, you can find us on our sexy new app. You can get a streaming bot broadcast, or you can listen to us on podcasts. Kevin Pace, our stellar producer, just informed me this morning before we went live that we just hit our 500th say that fast three times, Emily, 500th podcast download. So um, it's really Congrats. a really a cool thing that, excuse me, not download, but podcast, um, you know, being positioned up. Uh, we didn't start with podcasts. We've always been a broadcast. And so uh, this is kind of a cool thing. Okay, Emily Taylor, enough about us. You are in the hot seat, my friend. Coming to us from a snowy, blustery day in Chicago, talk to us about Teeny Big and what your work is. So at Teeny Big, I focus on strategic listing, and it's really to help organizations that are stuck in making decisions, stuck in moving forward, mm -hmm. uh, to really, you know, hit that, keep going and moving forward on their growth trajectory um, instead of, you know, really just stalling out and, um, you know, losing, losing sight of where they're going because they've sort of put on a lot of challenges. Um, so I, I help organizations get clarity. Um, and a lot of that is through listening to their community. Wow. I've got to believe that you deal with a lot of frustration, folks that are like, that want to do well, they want to do good and they want to do well and good at the same time, but they get frustrated and they need kind of a, a, uh, help and, and a roadmap. Yeah, I like to call it a, a reset. And this a lot of times comes from, you know, nonprofit leaders and staff are so good at what they do, mm -hmm. but often they can get themselves into a bit of a bubble. And so um, <laughs> when, but the, you know, it's it happens to the best of us yeah. that, you know, that really become expert at what we do, we can lose sight of what's around us. And so that's, that's really where I love to help is help get people out of that bubble, but also, you know, do it strategically. We don't need too many cooks in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, but Thank we you. need sometimes need a reset to really, you know, understand our value and who we are as an organization. So I love that. And I love the spirit of it. And I've got to be really candid with you. I don't hear that very often, right? I mean, it doesn't seem like that's an approach that is out there very often, sadly. I mean, it really should be. And I, I want to start by asking you this very first question. And that is, why take a step back from strategic planning? Is this like a don't do it? Or is it just like a 60 day thing or a year or or what does this look like to you in the in the bubble of strategic planning? Yeah, so this is really talking to those organizations that feel a little lost. Mm -hmm. um, you know, COVID threw a lot of people for a spin. Um, <laughs> organizations hired a ton of people. They got different sources of funding, programs around them. Other you know other partners they may have have you know become different people, yeah. you know, 
funders, just the everyday people around them have become different. And so even though we're coming out of a pandemic, I think just really uh, being able to stop and take a moment to say, hey, yeah, it's not just one thing that's different. There's like all sorts of things that are different. And so if we jump into a strategic plan right now, can we go through it in in a really, you know, um, intentional way. So mm -hmm. I really recommend to organizations that feel a little bit in turmoil, that feel like they might have lost a little bit of track of who they are, yeah. um, really take a step back because if you're not going in with at least a little bit of alignment, a little bit of idea of what that future might hold, um, you, know, you you might not uh, be able to really work cohesively and make those big decisions that you need to in a, in a strategic plan. And and I also will say that maybe a strategic plan isn't the right next step. If a lot of things in spin, there's a lot of different options of next steps. So I always have to be a strategic plan. Okay, so when you're talking, I, I love, again, the spirit with which you're looking at this and, and trying to be not so just task oriented, but really you know, thoughtful and, and looking at things in a deeper way. Let me ask you a follow-up question because I feel like there's one approach and one silo with the staff and the team, and then yet another one with the board. So often we see, and you've got to be at the front of this line, you see a, a board that comes up with a strategic plan that really cannot be enacted by the staff or the team that there's, you know, it hasn't come together holistically by everyone. So do you see this more so with the board versus the staff or do you see it going both directions? Well, again, we're talking about, you know, pre-strategic planning. So before really getting into those things, but, but yeah, the, you know, like if an organization has grown a lot over the last three years, they have staff that have worked there for 20 years and staff that have worked there for one year. They're not, they don't see the organization in the same way and same with the board. So really helping people get aligned on who the organization really is and what it values and how it makes decisions mm -hmm. um, can, can help unify people and set them up for success as they do go about making those decisions. And, and you'll see this in conflicts of, you know, staff feeling different ways about, you know, what the organization is and what it should be, right. boards bringing in their different ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's really where you get into this, you know, um, what I call the, I call decision-making quicksand as sort of like you are, uh, you know, no one can really move forward. Things get pushed off to the next meeting, but at the same time, you're not making them and you're slowly sinking into the consequences, the loss of, time and money um, of impact that you might be facing by not making those decisions. Oh man, I love that description because I have been there. I see it. Um, it's an awful feeling. And yet you have the pressure of your community bearing down on you to solve a problem, to be doing the business of what you were, you know, formed to do, whatever that may be. Um, it's a super tough thing. Let's talk about and have you explain to this something about the value of a pause. This is a really interesting thing because in the beginning of the pandemic, so many people were like, we're going to pause, we're going to you know, pump the brakes. And now everybody's like, bad decision, move forward, get going. You know, the, it just seems like everything's escalated and the pressure is bearing down on us. So how do we know what the value of the pause is and when to take it? Sure. So, you know, I, th I think having some of those things like, you know, not being able to talk about your organization in a similar way, or everyone's talking about it differently, yeah. you know, maybe not being fully staffed, maybe there's some big changes coming up, like program changes or, or leadership changes. Um, a lot of those things could create that turmoil. Um, and the value of taking a pause is to, to get back that confidence in knowing who you are, yeah. how you sit in your community, and how you make decisions, um, and not just you know, not just the executive director knowing this, like really having a lot of the leadership be aligned, as well as knowing that your community, where your community supports you, maybe where your actions are actually meeting their perception, or your 
your intentions are are being <laughs> perceived in the way that you think. Yeah. Um, so those are are some of the things. And I'll just, you know, it just reminds me of a, a client that I've been helping over the last year where they they doubled their staff over the pandemic. Yeah. They were doing some amazing work as they were getting grant yeah. funded funded right. for it. But they also took on a bunch of projects that maybe weren't always in their scope um, because the need was there. And right. so they felt a little lost in 2022, 2023. And so, um, and the other big thing was their executive director had been talking about retiring for <laughs> 10 years. <laughs> um, luckily yeah. for them, he was still there, but it was a situation where they hadn't done a strategic plan in probably 20 years. Uh, they, you know, they knew they needed to change, but they didn't really have this, this path forward. Mm -hmm. Um, and so their their number two actually reached out to me, which which happens a lot because they could kind of see right. They could see this bubble sometimes yeah. a little yeah. early, earlier. Um, and so as we were talking about some of their layers of challenges, I just asked her, I'm like, well, what what if he doesn't retire for another three years? Uh -huh. And the look on her face said it all. It was just like 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 she hadn't even thought that that could happen, but it already had happened. You know, he'd been talking about retiring forever. So, so she could see that decision quicksand, maybe, you know, subconsciously, um, but by bringing that to the surface, it would just really started to put forth like, okay, we need to work on these, these steps. That's really your next step. And so we've, we've been meeting over the last year and they actually just hired a search firm. So I'm really super excited for them in their future. So two questions come to mind. One of it, like sometimes you could say a pause is like a long weekend, right? Or a pause is a fiscal year or a season. What are you seeing when it comes to, to actually embracing the concept of pausing this, this looming issue of strategic plan? Yeah, well, and I... I... So in this case, you know, this example I gave, we we did we worked together for about four to six, about four months, and then I helped support them, you know, ongoing throughout the year. But we really were able to like build that identity and decision making, understanding it through the whole organization in that sh the shorter time period. Mm -hmm. But it really takes this ongoing, you know, sticking with it, accountability um, to be able to really start implementing those changes. So um, in this case, you know, the the goals were to start working through some of their priorities versus doing a strategic plan. Um, and they, you know, they had a lot of those, I call them the chicken and egg challenges. Do we do a strategic plan and then hire an executive director? Do we hire an executive director right. that strategic plan? Right. Um, and and so and some of those things can really cause be the cause of that decision making quicksand yeah. uh, because no one knows and so it goes to the next meeting and then the next meeting uh mm -hmm. and and so we just decided to to work through the priorities versus do a strategic plan and so that's you know that's really part of that step back is to not just pause and then go about what you were going to do anyways yeah. is to really go and think of like, is this, what is the right next step? Mm. Is it doing a strategic plan ourselves? Is it hiring some of the amazing strategic planners that are out there that, that come in all different, you know, scopes and sizes? Yeah. Um, or is it something totally different mm -hmm. where you really just need to test some things out? You need to hire new leadership. You need to do a reorg, like, just doing what you need to do versus what you should do. Right. You feel like you should do. Yeah. It seems to me like that you're talking about a lot of heavy lifting that can become quickly um, emotional and, and frightening because people are thinking about, you know, who's going to be here, who's not, you know, the health of the organization. Um, does this mean that it's easier if you do have that outside voice that can bring to truth to power or should it be, you know, more, is it something that an, a group can do on their own? I, I love that you brought that up because I do think, um, you know, one, there is so much emotion and, yeah. and if we ignore 
that emotion, that's part of why people aren't moving forward. You know, they're afraid to make that decision mm. or they're not sure if they'd get canceled or there's something, you know, like with an executive director leaving, there's so much emotion there, both from the staff not even be able to envision an organization without that leader to the leader being like, I can't envision a life without leading this organization. Right, right. Um, so so yeah. part of it is to acknowledge the emotion and what I find is by listening to your community, again, it's not to get to get all the cooks in the kitchen and get some sort of consensus on what you should be doing. But by hearing from your community what, for instance, your magic is, to hear stories about what they think you do best, um, it really helps align everybody and see past some of those, those fears Um for instance, like being able to envision the organization without the current leader. Yeah. When you hear from, you know, 15 different people in all different aspects of your community that they think your organization is X, Y, Z, that's your organization. That's not the leader. And so you can start to envision how you move forward and, and what that future might be because it's not so intertwined. Okay, so when you're talking about this, what and you're and you're doing, um, you know, a review or an interview of your community, what is that looking like? Like, what numbers are you are you saying we've got to interview a hundred people, twenty people, a thousand? What does that look like to you? My work is all customized by by what the organization needs. So sometimes it's a mix. If we need to hear from a lot of people, survey. Uh, okay. You know, if it's sort of similar groups of people, we can do focus groups, um, but need to hear from specific people. Interviews can really get to some of those in, you know, deeper questions about why and those stories that you don't always get to hear in the other formats. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's it's really about hearing from a range of people and looking for patterns um, that that can and translating them not into just like here's a bunch of opinions <laughs> um but into what you know what can help you prioritize and dis make decisions for your organization um and, and you know and not just not just get mixed up by all the voices right so emily i've got to ask this question when you do this how often when you when you give this information back to an organization, how often does it misalign or align with what they think is going on? I mean, I gotta believe that in some cases, it's a tough, it's a tough thing to re to reveal, right? Uh, maybe somebody, maybe a group doesn't have a great reputation, or maybe the community thinks that they actually do something different than what they think they're doing. I mean, how how does all that alignment take place? Yeah, well, a lot of times it's not this huge misalignment. Okay, good. Um, so I, you know, I think organizations, even if they're a little self-conscious about certain things or or maybe have been feeling the effects of of misalignment, mm -hmm. um, that most often, or, you know, their partners, their funders, their their staff, like their clients really appreciate and love what they do. Um, and so I kind of liken it more to, um, it's usually not like a whole new path is revealed as you talk yeah. to, uh, as you talk to people, but what you do find are all these little pebbles rather than moving a big rock, we're, we're finding little pebbles along those relationships. And so by able to pick those out and, and say, you know, these certain situations aren't making me feel welcome, or I have no idea what's going on in this part of your organization. It really, um, doing this work helps clear those pebbles so that you're not tripping over them and you're really able to focus on your work. Um, just as another example, I worked with an organization that had an amazing uh, founder who really grew the organization a ton and um, was you know, getting a lot of attention. But their number two as well came to me because they felt like something was affecting the relationships. And by doing work, we were able to realize that that partners and people outside the organization really only felt like 
the CEO was the only person they could trust Work. to make the decisions. Not that they didn't trust the rest of the staff, but they just felt like, oh, if if we make a decision, it's just going to get overridden right. by the, the CEO. And so the CEO didn't see this, but as, as we brought this up, yeah. the directors were like, oh, oh yeah, like I... I've been having this problem, this problem, this problem. And it's all because now I can see it's because they don't, they don't trust that our conversation is the final conversation. And so that is an area that was on a, maybe a little bigger than a pebble, but um, an area where they could start to really address how do they give power to the rest of their leadership so that they can do their best work. Right. You know, it's so interesting because a lot of times within strategic planning, you know, we identify who's going to lead that whatever that action is, how it's going to be reported out. And so if we don't have some of these things um, defined and structured, um, the strategic plan becomes a whole mess. I can I, so I can see how that ecosystem of, you know, performance and, and, and um, decision making factors in in a way that is it's really powerful but not always identifiable i want to before we let you go and and i have so many more questions um it seems to me that a lot of funders board members stakeholders they kind of demand a strategic plan whether they know if it's good or it's bad or it's accurate or it's being worked whatever is not the question it's almost like they want that book you know that might just be sitting on a shelf right Sit on the shelf, yeah. It sits on the shelf yeah. and until you bring it out before the next strategic plan and you're like, oh yeah, we forgot about that. We didn't do this. We didn't do that. How do you um, communicate to your stakeholders in the community that you're in this process, that maybe you're not going to just do a strategic plan like everyone else, or you're going to look at it differently? What, what does that look like? Yeah, I find a lot of people feeling like they should do a strategic plan. And a lot of times that is coming from funders yeah. or board members who know that's, you know, what nonprofits would do. But I would say if your intuition is saying, yeah, this just doesn't feel right, uh -huh. uh, it's probably onto something because just, mm -hmm. you know, should doing a strategic plan really isn't a great reason for it. Um, and so the question I always ask is, well, what, what are those funders really looking for? And what I um, typically find is that, you know, funders, they want to know that you're thinking ahead, that you're not just focused on the now, mm -hmm. that you have not only a vision statement, but a vision um, mm -hmm. and have, have processes to, to get there. So mm -hmm. when you start to pull apart what a strategic plan is and the value you want to get out of it, we can start to look at, it doesn't have to be a book. Um, it could be a spreadsheet. It could, you know, be a series of pictures that, you know, you inspire you, but also, you know, talk about your plan for the future and allow you to share it with people who don't want to read a big book. So mm -hmm. once we start to think through that, and that's usually part of my process is, um, you know, really, and, you know, grounding and like, well, what, now that we know the challenges and know what you want to prioritize, what's the best tool for you to move forward? Because it could be a strategic plan um, in various formats, but it could be something else. Uh, you know, you might have a team of visual thinkers uh, right. and they really need something <laughs> different than, you know, 12 pages right. of words um, right. or, but you might, you know, that might be your thing. So um, I think, I like to take words and really pull them apart. Be like, what are we really talking about? Mm -hmm. um, and that starts to answer that question of, of what you need to do. You know, Emily, this has been such an amazing conversation and it's really an important conversation, especially at this time of the year, as we're looking forward, um, a, lot of a lot of changes are occurring right now in the nonprofit sector and across all society. But, you know, it's just, for our sector, it's such an important time to be thinking about this. Before I let you go, can you give us an idea, and not just your company, but what we should be looking at when we go out to find somebody that can facilitate this? What would that budget range look like? 
The, the budget range can be huge. So I not quite even sure how to put, put a number to it, but I, I think really going back into finding what you need um, because you can, you can do strategic planning um, on your own uh, and you can hire people into the tens of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, but in a pre-strategic plan, you really, you know, you really need the time to be, be thoughtful and reflective um, so that you can find the right, right answer. And I know, um, I think we talked, I, I do have a resource that, that people can also grab as well that will help them think through, okay. do, do they need to take that step back or not? Awesome. And they can find uh, Emily Taylor, principal of Teeny Big. Go to teeny, T-E-E-N-Y, B-I-G, teenybig.com um, and, and t check out her website. Um, and that's where you can find those resources and that information. Oh, um, if if you're able to include the link, we can we can add it to um, to this. But um, yeah, I'll uh, I don't think I have it on there at the moment. But um, people can certainly reach out to me, and I can get it to them. Awesome, very very good. Well, Emily, it's been great to have this conversation with you. Um, I like a lot of what you said. It's stuff that I haven't heard before. I do think that across the sector, 1.8 million nonprofits registered in this country. You know, they all feel like they got to have the strategic plan and why or how they use it is a whole nother story. Unfortunately, it seems like we just rush to get this done, like it's a pro forma issue. And so I appreciate you helping us understand how we can step back and maybe look at the strategic plan in a different way. I also want to add that I noticed even like with um, the different accounting companies and finance companies that we work with or that come on the show, we learned this from your part-time controller. I mean, they're working more and more with data viz. I mean, understanding that they can't just be communicating in the same old, same old, that they have to embrace different ways of sharing information. So what you said was fascinating to me because I think that's where a lot of us are kind of trying to, to navigate towards. And so it'll be really interesting to, to start to hear more and more about that. Very, very important. Very, very cool. Really? Yeah. Well, Emily, we, um, again, so appreciate you coming uh, with us and being with us today. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd, honest to goodness, is conducting a strategic planning seminar today. And, you know, we couldn't have scheduled this. and It was just like a crazy thing, but ha that's how it happened. Um, so anyway, she'll be back with us shortly. Again, you know, we have so many amazing folks that, that partner with us, and they include Bloomerang, the American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy, at National University, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Um, they joined us along with Emily uh, Taylor today to get into some of the weeds on some of these things so that you can achieve your mission, vision, and values. And we are super grateful for that. Okay, my new friend, you've given me a lot to think about today, and that's always a great thing. So thank you. It was great to talk to you, Julia. A lot of fun. And uh, I think that we need to have you back on as we start to rethink this whole drama, and I'm going to call it out of the drama of nonprofit strategic planning. Not too For many. sure. Yeah, not too many people show up and say, well, I can't wait to do that, right? It's usually just like, a, uh, and so I love. Yeah, let's calling. make it a little less uh, and more purposeful, intentional, and helpful. Yeah, and 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 really a tool. Um, to your point, and that it becomes helpful and, and it gives us a roadmap that we can use. Well, Emily, every day we end the nonprofit show with this mantra, and I will share it with you, our viewers, and of course, our listeners. And that is to stay well so that you can do well. We hope that you have a great day and we'll see you back here tomorrow. 